And we're in a series called The Traits of the Greats. Say that with me. Say The Traits of the Greats. Look at Philippians chapter 4. This is Paul in verse 8. Paul's writing the church in Philippi. And he writes, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, and whatever things are of good report. Someone say good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. Verse 9 says, the things which you learned and received and heard, and this is the key, and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Praise the Lord. Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and tell him God wants to give us the attitude of the greats. Amen. You may be seated. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you for a few minutes on the attitude of the greats. Last week, I shared something with you. I'll say it again, that next to knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we've been learning that there's also some vital traits that we need within our life if we want to enter into good success. I think that's why we, we come to the house of the Lord, because we want to serve the Lord. How many of you say, man, I want to serve the Lord? And, 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 and you want to serve the Lord with good success. And we're recognizing that it's Jesus, but it's also certain characteristics that we need in our life to not only enter into good success, but to possess the promises of God and to stay in his will. Last week, I talked to you about wisdom. How many enjoyed that message? I had a lot of people messaging me saying, Pastor, that was a great message on wisdom. I never heard a, a message on wisdom like that. I said, well, that's good news because I've never preached a message on wisdom like that either. <laughs> I talked to you about wisdom, but this week I want to talk to you about another important trait that you need, and that's attitude. I, I think it's important to understand that if we want to be everything God has called us to be, we must possess the right attitude. Let's talk about attitude for a moment. Attitude is an issue of the mind and is manifest in the behavior, outlook, and eventually the outcome of a person's life. Attitude is powerful in your life. The great author on leadership, John Maxwell, how many have ever read some of his books? He said, attitude is the paintbrush for our life. Ad think about that for a moment. Attitude is the paintbrush for our life. Now, how important is attitude? Someone once said that attitude will heal you or hurt you. Attitude will make you friends or make you enemies. Ooh, how I many just, man, just, you know, you had a bad attitude and it just messed up a relationship. Attitude. Attitude will make you happy or make you miserable. And ultimately, attitude will lead you to success or could possibly even lead you to defeat or failure. Here's what I want to teach you this morning about attitude is that attitude is an inside out job. It's an inside out job. Scripture talks about attitude in, in different ways. When the Bible teaches about attitude, what it, what it speaks of is our inner life. I, I want you to know one of the most important things is your inner life. It's not always what's happening on the outside, but it's the battle and the war that wages on the inside. The Bible talks about attitude in the way of inner life. And we must also see in Scripture that the inner life is a priority to God. The inner life is a priority to God. The word of God actually links the attitude, watch this, to the condition of the heart. So if you want to boil on down to the nitty gritty, what is the condition of your heart this morning? See, being someone who, who knows what it is to be delivered. How many have ever been delivered of anything? We've got people here that have been delivered of drugs and alcohol and abusive relationships. And you've, you've been delivered of some, of some things in your life. And I also know what it is to be delivered in my life. 
I know what it is to be delivered from things like 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 inner struggle. I know what it is to be delivered from things like depression. I know what it is to have a family that struggled with depression and, and struggled with fear and struggled with anxiety within their life. Many of you know what it is to come out of families like that and being a person that, that knows what it is to be delivered of depression and fear and an anxiety. I've learned that often that what is happening around me is a result of what's happening in me. That's a good word this morning. I, I had to learn that. It took me a little while to learn that. It took me a little while to discover that the things around me weren't as bad as they seemed, that the situations around me weren't as, as hard as they seemed, that the problems around me weren't going to take my life. Come on, somebody. But when your inner life is in right, is in right condition with God, you can face the battle. You can face the storm. You can face the situation. What's happening inside of me is important. So the question I have this morning, could it be that our inner thoughts and our inner attitudes could cause us, us to see things the right way or the wrong way? I, I, I talk to so many Christians that, that they're just so off when they talk about their situation and they're so off when they talk about what's going on in their life and, 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 and they think it's going to be fatal, it's going to be devastating. But I came to tell you that, that God's got it under control this morning. Who, who, who's happy about it? God's got it under control. Everything's going to be all right. See, the Bible talks about the inner health of a man or a woman. How many say, you know, Pastor, this is a good message because I, I would love to be not only healthier physically on the outside, but I'd love to be healthier on the inside. Well, the Bible talks about inner health. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, chapter four, verse 23, the Bible says this. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it flow the springs of life. Amen. Keep your heart. In other words, guard your heart. Can you just look at your neighbor and tell them, guard your heart? It's the inner man that matters. It's the inner life that matters. Guard your heart. Proverbs 119, you say, how do I guard my heart? Pastor, Proverbs 119, verse 11 says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Amen. And how many know the thing that decays our spirit is sin? The thing that decays the, the, the spirit and the heart of a believer is, is when sin creeps in. And, and, and David, the psalmist, said, put your word in your heart so that sin can't come in. Someone say, guard your heart. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, it says, a good man out of the good measure of his heart brings forth good things. A, a good man out of the, the good measure of his heart. When, when his heart has the word in it, and his heart, his inner life is working the way it needs to be working. Come on, talk to me now. Everything's fully functional. A, a good man it, out of the good man's heart, watch this, brings forth good things. And, and many of us know what it is to be in that season when, when, when those good things are flowing out of our life. You got a good word for somebody. You've got a word of encouragement for somebody. You, you're, you're, you're in a season, not a taking, but you're in a season of giving. Come on, somebody. Why do you give? Why do good things for you? Why is there a river of life flowing out of you? Because your heart is in the right place. Come on, somebody. Your heart is working the way it needs to be working. Come on and shout. Come on and say, yes, that's the kind of heart I want to have. Can I get a different mic, my brothers? You see, we've got to protect our heart. We've got to Guard our heart. Tell your neighbor, please guard your heart. Please guard your heart. Because if your heart's bad, it's going to affect me. Because if your heart's not working the way it's working, it's going to affect your brother. It's going to affect your sister. It's going to affect your marriage. It's going to affect your children. It's going to affect your grandchildren. Come on, somebody. I, I think this is a word because if we want to get to the place God has called us to go, we've got to look inside. We've got to say, God, take care, let me, teach me to take care of my heart. See, there's consequences when we don't take care of our heart. In Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 21, it says, but as for those whose heart goes after detestable things. And their abominations, he said, I will bring their deeds upon their own head, says the Lord God. And I got to tell you that if you're living a life and you're pursuing detestable things, detestable things and things that are contrary 
to God's will in your life. And don't be surprised when it, you know, so many people, man, they, you know, they, 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 they blame God for the storms. But God says you can't continue to chase detestable things and not expect there to be some consequences in your life. And some consequences in your marriage and some consequences in your money. Come on, somebody. We've got to guard the inner man. Psalms 51, the most famous scripture, one of the first scriptures I've ever memorized was King David after he had sinned. And he had slept with Bathsheba and he killed her husband, set him up to be hit. He said, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Watch this but also renew a right spirit in me. And if you're going to come to this altar this morning, ask God to clean your heart, but ask God to get your spirit right. Say, Lord, I can't leave this church this morning until my spirit is in the condition. And if you've got a spirit that needs correction in your life, say, Lord, this is my morning to make that change, to have that breakthrough. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to stay in the pit. Come on, somebody. I'm coming out into a new season. Woo. So if the Bible says that there's such thing as a right spirit, could it be that there's such thing as a wrong spirit? Right. And that wrong spirit has a way of locking us up and locking us out of our future. And, and this morning I came with one message. That's to get you free. That's to get you free. Some of you this morning, you're coming out of the pit. You're coming out of the depression. You're coming out of the fear. I have no reason to fear. The Lord is my life. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody needs that word this morning. Somebody needs that revelation this morning. You're coming out. Tell your neighbor you're coming out. So let's talk about some of the attitudes that the Lord gave me. There's many, but I want to just bring two out. Just two out this morning. Two attitudes of the greats. Write this down. Number one, I think this is probably, you know, if you're going to be Victory Outreach, you, you've got to have this one. You're going to be a part of this church. You've got to have this one. And many of you know it already. It's an attitude of gratitude. Woo. That's right. I'm trying, sister. <laughs> I love it. Keep talking to me, too, man. Someone say gratitude. Someone said, when you feel like giving up, go back to why you started. Flashback. See, gratitude is a viable trait in the Christian life, especially in a leader. Because how many know the spirit of a leader produces a spirit in a church? And as leaders, how many know we've got to constantly walk in a spirit of gratitude? We've got to constantly walk remembering why we started. You see, gratitude can be defined as the act and feelings of thankfulness for a gift. And, and I'll tell you, every one of us, if you really stop and look at your life, every one of us have a reason to be grateful this morning. I'll, I'll tell you this. Have, have you ever seen a turtle on a fence post? Well, if you have, I'll tell you this. He didn't get there by himself. I'm going to stop. Some of you are like, I don't get it. Let me break it down for you. You didn't get there by yourself. You didn't get to that place of blessing by yourself. You didn't get to that, that marriage. Your marriage didn't get there by itself. That money didn't come by itself. Somebody helped you. And I think it takes for some of us to begin to rise up this morning and say, Lord, I thank you that you saved me. I thank you that you delivered me. I thank you, God. I've got a reason to be grateful this morning. According to Stan Toller, an author, he said, the foundation for gratitude is the belief or perception that we are fortunate. That's powerful. The foundation for gratitude is the belief or perception that we are fortunate. You know, it was hot this summer. How many know this was a hot summer? One of the hottest in San Diego history. In all these... Christians walking around, it's hot, it's hot, it's so hot. 
It's hot. I can't live like this. They went on Facebook, and, and, and it's hot, and it's hot, and I, it's too hot. And, and oh, God, you know, the lizards are wearing sneakers. <laughs> and you know what I felt like telling those Christians? Be glad that the Lord delivered you from a hotter place. <laughs> you could have went to hell. You could have died in prison. You could have died with that needle in your arm, but God saw something in you that you could not see in yourself. How many are still grateful for what the Lord has done? See, we're not deficient. We're fortunate. We've got more than we have. We're in a better place than we were. Come on, somebody. We are fortunate. We are blessed. We are highly favored. We have a destiny. We have a vision. We are God. I'm going to just praise him because God did a miracle in my life. Woo. Touch your neighbor and just tell him you're fortunate. He goes on to say this. I'm preaching good. See, I have to amen myself sometimes. He goes on to say this, this author, he says, having that positive awareness results in gratefulness and produces a lighter spirit. Mm. And that's what I felt like some of you needed this morning. You come in here with a heavy spirit. But, but, but gratefulness will bring back that lighter spirit. Gratefulness will break the yoke of fear, depression, and anxiety. And you're not going to walk with your head down anymore. You're going to walk with your head up and your hands lifted. And you're going to leave this place with a song in your mouth this morning. Why don't you just go ahead and just give him a little bit of praise for his goodness in your life. Now, let me just share this with you is when you're walking with a forward moving God. He's constantly leading us and directing us towards his promises, directing us towards his plans. How many of you want his plan? Amen. Leading us and guiding us to good territory. But sometimes that journey will bring you through some tough terrain. Some tough terrain. And when, when, when tough times arise, and, and when tough times arise, emotions become out of control. Emotions begin to come out of control and valuable relationships become stressed. And how many know sometimes change will come? It becomes a threat to our attitude. How powerful is this? Listen to this. If trouble can alter your attitude, your attitude can alter your outlook. Your outlook can alter your behavior and, and your behavior could ultimately alter the trajectory of your life. I've learned this, and I want you to leave with this this morning. I've learned that it is impossible to reach your destiny with an ungrateful spirit. Who agrees with their pastor? Come on and just give him praise right now. I, I've seen how some people get so ungrateful that it leads them to the door of spiritual death. Spiritual death. They're so ungrateful. They've just gotten to a place where they've just totally forgotten what the Lord has done. Just totally disregarded it. And I'll tell you, if you find yourself in, in that place where you're at the door of spiritual death, or you have a spouse this morning that you, you know, you're, you're praising God, hoping that they'll hear you praise God, and one day start praising with you, but they still don't praise. And, they, and you're praying extra loud in the morning. You're like, oh, Father God, right now. You know, then you start praying for them, and then, you know, like, Lord, touch them, like my wife does for me sometimes. I'm like, this woman. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and if you have someone in your life that has come to the doorway of spiritual death because they've forgotten what the Lord has done, you need to challenge them or challenge yourself to go and look back and reflect on the entire work of God in your life. Watch. Because what the Lord has done is not just in this season, it's in many seasons of your life. That's why King David once again said in Psalms chapter 9, verse 1, he said, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, watch this, and I will recount 
all. Just say all. all. Don't say some. Okay. Don't say what's happening right now. Someone say all. all. He says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to recount all of your wonderful deeds. And then he goes on to say a little later, he said, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed and a stronghold in a time of trouble. And if you find yourself in a season of trouble right now and you find yourself in a season where you're uncertain and you don't know what the future holds, I came to tell you, go back and give God some praise, not for what he's doing in this season, but he, what he's done in seasons gone by. I can, I can tell you I've got a reason to praise God because I can still remember when I was in that hospital room for 200 days. I can still remember when I was in the ICU in Boston for 100 days. I can still remember some dark seasons in my life where I thought I wasn't going to serve God anymore, where I thought I wasn't going to make it, where I thought I'd never preach another sermon, where I thought that God would never give me another word. But I'm grateful this morning that I'm here. And the Lord has been faithful. Come on, somebody. And if God has been faithful in my life, I came to tell you, God will be faithful in your life. Go ahead and tell the devil I demand a recount. Go ahead and tell the devil I demand a recount. Devil, you got to stop lying to me. I put you under my feet. God has been too good in my life. I came to tell you this, that your life is a work of art and you're still in process. Your attitude is your paintbrush. And how many know you, you, you want to paint? You, you got to paint your life with a clean brush, not a dirty brush. And, and sometimes when that brush is dirty, you got to dip it in some water. You need to take your attitude and dip it in the water of the Holy Ghost this morning and, and, and start painting again. Start painting again. Someone say gratefulness. That was good. Let me give you the last point this morning. Did you get something today? Attitude, right? Famously, they said your attitude will determine your what? Your altitude. It's true, man. The second attitude we need and the second attitude of the greats is an attitude of persistence. It's not only being grateful, but it's being persistent, being persistent. Someone said that the person on the top of the mountain didn't fall there. How did you get up there? Well, baby girl, I'll tell you, they didn't fall there. John Osteen, who was the founding pastor of Lakewood Church, today the largest church in the United States, and really one of the great churches of our generation, you know, wasn't always a large church. He started the church in 1959 in an abandoned feed store in a predominantly black neighborhood. Osteen was faithful to give his very best every day to that small group of people who initially attended his church. He had a passion and a zeal that attracted many more people. And by the time John Osteen died in 1999, he'd built a thriving congregation that had more than 43,000 people and is now led by his son, Joel Osteen. Now, toward the end of his life, John Osteen was questioned by a writer about his church that he had built. And of course, the writer wanted to know Osteen's secret for success. How many know when you win, they want to know why? And so what's your secret for success? What rare and mysterious quality did you possess that enabled you to do what few church leaders have ever done in the history of Christianity? And when confronted with the question, John Osteen, who was a humble man, simply said that he had been successful because he had been in Houston, Texas, longer than any other pastor. The other pastors who were there when he first arrived in 1959 had died, retired, or accepted positions in other communities. 
and they were no longer at their post in Houston. Osteen attributed his success, therefore, to the fact that he had simply been around longer than his peers. The older people are clapping. Young people are like, you're like, what? <laughs> when you get a little older, you'll clap too. <laughs> you'll clap too. While others had packed up and moved away over the years, he stuck things through. And he stayed in Houston so long that he basically outlasted all the other pastors of all the other churches. And I'll tell you this, man, if you want to get a hold of God's will and be successful in the kingdom of God, you, you, you've got to have some pop in your walk. He said, pop in my walk. Someone say pop. P-O-P. P -O -P. <laughs> the power of perseverance. <laughs> I love it. Because, man, you got some dead walkers in the house of the Lord. Dead man walking, dead woman walking. We could always see the ones that got a little pop in their walk. That when others are stepping back, they're stepping up. While others are stepping out, they're stepping in. Where others are throwing in the towel, they're picking up the towel and they're serving others. Come on, somebody. And we need some leaders at Victory Outreach San Diego that are going to get some pop in their walk, get the power of perseverance. That... <laughs> pastor, why are you here? Because you're the best looking pastor? No. Because you're the smartest pastor? No. Because you know everything? No. Because you got to write this and write that? No. You know why I'm here? Because I got some pop in my walk. People walk away from me. I said, it's all right. God still got a plan for my life. God's still, God still moving me towards my destiny. I'm just looking for somebody that wants to go with me. You don't want to go, that's fine. But I'm looking for some people that got some pop in their walk, some people that want to make an impact, some people that want to help some families whose kids are in the hospital, some people that say, I want to build some Bible studies and win some ex-drug addicts and gang members and prisoners to the Lord. I, I need a people with some pop in their walk this morning that understand that God has given us a vision and God has given us a plan and God has given us a mission. Tell your neighbor, you got some pop in your walk. You need some pop in your walk. If you want to be king of the mountain, man, you got to keep climbing. You can't quit. You can't throw in the towel. You can't get upset over every little trial. You can't get all twisted. Oh, come on, somebody. You need some pop in your walk. You need to be persistent. What is persistence? It's knowing in advance that you're going to have obstacles. <laughs> you think a mountain climber gets surprised when he runs into an obstacle? Do you think a mountain climber gets surprised when he gets some blisters on his hands and some blisters on his feet? Do you think a mountain climber gets surprised when he, he twists an ankle on the journey? Come on, somebody, you need some pop in your walk. You need some pop in your climb this morning. Persistence is knowing you're going to have some obstacles. Persistence is knowing this. Watch this. You're going to have some difficult days. You're going to have some difficult days. Am I in the right church this morning? Man, look at man. But don't let your days turn into weeks. Your weeks turn into months. Your months turn into years. Just understand that there's going to be days where you feel sick in body. There's going to be days where you don't feel like getting up and doing the Lord's work. There's going to be days where you feel down in the dumps. There's going to be some days that are going to be difficult. But when you got some pop in your walk, you make it through the difficult days. You got to understand that persistence is knowing you're going to have some tough terrain. There's going to be some relational issues. There's going to be some loneliness in your life and in your leadership. You know, people could be like squirrels sometimes come get their nut and run away. I 
I just came to church to get my nut. That's because you a squirrel. And every we go, you just grab a nut and leave and grab a nut and leave. We ain't raising up no squirrels here at Victory Outreach San Diego. We're going to get you in a net called the Family Life Law and start discipling you and start training you. We're going to get you in the men's home and we're going to start training you. We're going to get you into a disciple. We're going to get you in a ministry. Come on, somebody. God hasn't called you to be a squirrel. Say, pastor's coming this morning. <laughs> Persistence knowing is knowing you're going to have some stuff. You're going to have times of lack. Times when you have it, times when you don't. <laughs> times when you got to dip into your savings account unexpectedly. Woo, ladies, you got to dip in that mad money. It doesn't feel good, does it? But you're going to have seasons that are unforeseen. You're going to have some seasons that come that, man, you didn't see that coming. You didn't see that storm coming. You didn't see that sickness coming. You didn't see that event coming. But what are you going to do? See, many people quit right before the breakthrough. Many people quit right before the final test. They quit before the final and I've learned that what makes people stop running many times, and I'm bringing it in, is when they don't recognize or understand what's in front of them. There was a story of a lady many years ago who was a strong runner. She was a, a, a track and field runner. And she ran long distance races in her small country town, and she was good. And every time she got up to run, she ran with speed and endurance and strength, and she really beat all the competition. Till one day, she was invited for the first time to go run a, a track meet in the big city. And as she got into that track meet in the big city with all these competitors, she was her usual self. She was strong, she was fast, and she had endurance, and she was moving, and she was winning the race. She carried a 30-yard lead the entire race. And when she came down to the final stretch, she saw something she had never seen before. They had taken a piece of paper, a tape, and they stretched it across the finish line. And as she's running towards the finish line, she stopped and said, what is that? Are they detouring the race to the left or the right? Do I jump over it? Do I crawl under it? What is that thing? I've never seen it before. And as she stopped to look at that tape, the person who was in second place, 30 yards behind, passed her and won the race. And I've seen many Christians like that. Run a race for a long time. Serve God for a long time. They've served in a church for a long time. They fought all the spiritual battles. They've been through some of the hardest storms, but then they see something in their way that they've never seen before. And instead of doing what they've been trained to do and doing what they've learned their entire Christian walk, they stop because they don't recognize it. But I came to tell you this morning, when you've got a pop in your walk, nothing's going to stop you. And I encourage you that if you've got something in your way this morning, keep on running towards the prize. Keep on running towards the vision. Keep on running towards your destiny. Somebody say, I'm going to run no matter what the devil puts in front of me, no matter what obstacle comes against me, no matter what sickness tries to hit my body, no matter what storm rises up. I'm not going to let a little tape stop me. I'm going to win the race. Keep running. When in doubt, I love it. Who said that? When in doubt, run it out. You know why I love that? Because I played football all my life. I played sports all my life and you would get injured on the field. You can stand, I'm done. And you would get injured on the field. <laughs> Who played sports? And my, my, my coach would say, are you all right? Are you injured? Are you hurt? I'd be, yeah, I'm hurt. And he'd say, you know what? Run it out. 
Run it out. Just keep on running. Keep that body warm. Keep that body moving. Keep doing what you know to do. Don't move at half speed. Move at full speed. And that's how we're going to get to the next season, somebody. We've got to put some pop in our walk. We've got to have an attitude of gratitude and an attitude of perseverance. Woo. Keep on running. Even if you find yourself in an unfamiliar season. I don't know who I came to speak to this morning. I see some of you videotaping me. Uh, I, do you want to go back and watch those videos? Do you? Or you post them on Facebook? That's cool. I, I think we need the right attitude. We need the right attitude. We need to stay grateful no matter what happens in our life. That's what makes us special. That's what makes Victor Outreach unique. It's not heavy teaching. It's not heavy skill ministry and slick marketing and, you know, prestige. You know, that's not what makes us great. What makes us great is the attitude in this place. The attitude of gratitude. The attitude that says, God, you know, where would I be without victory outreach? You know, I think of myself like I was as I was writing this message, I was thinking. If I had got saved in another ministry, what would I have been? Not having the gift, the talents, the education, the connections. Nothing. Having a messed up family. What would I have been? I was like, man, you know, I probably would have been the best usher in the church. They would have never let me preach. They would have never let me come up here. But thank God for Victory Outreach. If you want to become something great in this church, just be grateful and just be persistent. You don't got to be good looking. You don't got to, you know, be perfectly fit, have all the right clothes and all the wor right words all the time. Just be grateful. Just know how to be broken in the presence of God. Don't walk, don't hold up. Yeah. Don't walk proud like a peacock. Like you're the gift to the church. We never get sad when people like that leave. Never. <laughs> be grateful. So Lord, where would I be if it was not for your love and your mercy and the special ministry that you called me to? I think that this is a moment to be grateful. This is a moment to be grateful. This is a moment to thank the Lord. Do we have a, a, a grateful song? A grateful song, something where it will stir our gratefulness and stir our perseverance. We got a moment or two. Lift your hands all over this place and love them all over this place.